This Equipment World video is brought to you by Chevron Dello 600 ADF Ultra Low Ash Diesel Engine Oil. It's time to kick some ash. Hi everyone, welcome back to Equipment World. You're watching The Dirt. I'm your host, Brian, and today we're gonna talk about one of the biggest topics in any of the trades. We're gonna start talking about the labor force shortage and what's being done to help that problem in our country. Today, I've got Brian McGuire on from the Associated Equipment Distributors, and outside of some lobbying and other things that they do, one of the things they focus on is education. So today, I wanted to talk with Brian specifically about how aware why Washington is of the labor force problem when it comes to the trades. So without further ado, because I don't know anything, I'm totally ignorant on this subject, we're going to turn it over to the interview I conducted with Brian. But before we get into that, I want to take a second to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Chevron Lubricants. Protecting your diesel engine and its exhaust after treatment system has traditionally been seen as an either or proposition when it comes to choosing the engine oil that's going to protect your system. And that's exactly why Chevron spent more than a decade of R&D work developing a no compromise formulation. Now I don't have to tell you why a clogged DPF is bad news, but here's the real kick in the pants. 90% of that ash clogging up your DPF and then upping your fuel and maintenance costs? It comes from your engine oil. You might be thinking, why don't they make an engine oil with less ash in it then? You'll be happy to learn that Chevron agrees with you. They've developed a new ultra low ash diesel engine oil that is specifically designed to combat DPF ash clogging. Dello 600 ADF with OmniMax technology cuts sulfate ash by 60%, radically reducing the rate of DPF clogging and extending the DPF service life by two and a half times. Before you had to choose between protecting your engine or your after treatment system, now you don't. Dello 600 ADF with OmniMax technology. It's time to kick some ash. Well, Brian, thank you for being on the show today. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to discuss workforce development in the trades. Well, Brian, anytime somebody named Brian asks me to come on a show, you can count on it that uh, it's my pleasure to be there. <laughs> uh, and I'm excited to be here because I think this is an exciting topic to talk about and so important not only to our uh, our nation and our communities, but, but it's important for future generations of the workforce to know the opportunities that are out there for them to have a good sustaining career. Absolutely. I totally agree. Uh, the trades are not pushed enough in this country and there's not enough focus put on the trades as far as them being a viable career path. So that kind of leads me into my first question. So uh, it's it's very well known amongst the trades that we're suffering from this workforce shortage. Uh, my big question, since you guys kind of deal directly with Washington a lot, is at the Washington level, you know, what kind of acknowledgement is there of the problem? Well, you know, I'll tell you, I think there's been a lot of change that's occurred particularly in the last five years. And first and foremost is that Washington realizes that we have a workforce issue in the trades uh, and we have to start to do something about it. Now, that doesn't mean that Washington's ready to move on this. It just means at least they're talking about it. And I think there's a real recognition in Washington circles that there's nothing wrong with going for a four-year degree. But that's not for everybody. And we also, our economy has a lot of positions that need to get done and pay very well that don't require a four-year degree. And I think there's a conversation going on now about lifelong learning, because that's really what people need to do. Even if you go into the trades or if you, or if you go to college and you come out, you're not done learning. And I, and I think that's the refocus that's starting to happen. Um, and I think that the uh, members of Congress are really taking a look at how do we begin training a workforce for the country as opposed to just sending everybody off for degrees. So that actually talking about four year degrees, that's always been something that I've harped on is, is that we push college as the only viable option. And, and if you can't hack it in college, then you fall back on the trades. And, and so I feel like Washington in, in particular has kind of pushed that agenda as well with some of the legislation that's come through um, outside of the infrastructure bill, because I know there is a, a component in the infrastructure bill that kind of addresses some of uh, the training uh, outside of that. There's been a lot of legislation to kind of push people into college now that they're kind of recognizing the problem 
Is there anything kind of coming down the pipeline from a legislation standpoint that's going to help push people into the trades? Well, you know, and here's what here's what I would tell you. I think that while we like to blame Washington for that, I actually think that's come from the local level. Um, I really believe that local school boards chose to dismantle their trades programs. Now, everybody everybody supported this and thought this was the greatest thing to do. Um, and, you know, you know, and this has been a, a problem that we've been dealing with for about 30 years. So the local governments dismantle their trade programs. Uh, and I think that Washington certainly didn't do anything to dissuade that. But, but those were decisions made locally by local, in, in most cases, local elected school boards or locally appointed school boards. They own those decisions. And quite frankly, so did the trades, because we let it happen. We stood by as it went. And, and even members of the trades fell victim to this, uh, this, uh, this song that came out of the folks that said, listen, the only way to prosperity and success is a four-year degree. So it's okay that I'm a plumber. It's okay that I work on diesel construction equipment, but I don't want my son or daughter to do that. You know, I want them to have a much better life. And I think what we found took, took 30 years to figure this out, right? That degree doesn't necessarily guarantee that. Doesn't guarantee those things that we all, you know, bought into that all that you got to do is pay tuition for four years, uh, pass, right? That that's key to success. It is for some, right? I mean, listen, uh, we, we need some folks that uh, uh, have gone through higher learning. There's no doubt about that. But I think the recognition that the skills are higher learning. They're, 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 there's no difference from a learning standpoint. It's just what they've learned. Uh you know, members of the trades, uh, whether you're in high skilled manufacturing, whether you're in the building trades or, of course, the one that I'm most concerned about, the diesel construction and, and ag technicians, um, you know, they are uh, th th they've learned, too, and they continue to learn. And that's why one of the things that we've kind of tried to eliminate from our vocabulary here at AED is we no longer call it training. And you know why? Because a member of Congress, there's a wonderful member of Congress, Virginia Fox. Virginia Fox uh, used to be a community college president, and she taught me something. She said, Brian, you train your dog. You educate people. And so, and so we don't train the trades. We educate them. Now, they're educated in a much different way, right? They go through apprentice programs. They are learning demonstrating, learning, then mastering what they're doing. A little bit different from sitting in a lecture hall uh, or going on to become a doctor or a lawyer. They're, they're learning too, but in a different way. And I think that she, she's absolutely right. So we like to call it all education. Um, and whether that education uh, occurs with a, with a tool belt strapped onto you as you're uh, learning how to be a, a carpenter or whether you're being educated in how to be a diesel construction uh, or ag equipment technician, it's all education. And I, and I think while that sounds like a very subtle thing, it's how we have to begin to think because that's how they think in Europe when it comes to apprentice programs. There's no – society does not look differently on somebody who has gone through an apprentice program uh, to learn their, their skill, to become educated – in that skill, they don't look down differently at that person, you know, uh, because they didn't attend a four-year university. And I think that that's, and I think that's where we have to move. And one of the things that's helping us move there is we don't, we have a shortage, right? So uh, pay is coming up. Uh, although I will tell you for diesel uh, construction technicians uh, and ag technicians, the pay has always been really good. You know, these great uh, middle, upper middle class careers. And again, just like the person who comes in from a, a university, just because that's where you start doesn't mean that's where you have to end in, a, in a, your career in a company. If you come in 
as a diesel construction technician for an AED equipment dealer uh, or one of our ag dealers is one of their techs, you don't have to stay there your entire career, but the, the knowledge and education you receive to do that will serve you well in that career path if you want to go into sales, if you want to become the dealership owner. Those, that education you got learning how to fix equipment will serve you very well in those fields. And I, and I think that that's really, um, you know, what people are starting to wake up to. Uh, and, I, and I certainly think that Congress is, you know, there is a conversation occurring. We don't have a bill yet uh, to do this, but, but there is a lot of conversation about allowing federal uh, college funds to go towards certificate programs uh, taught at community colleges that tend to be, those certificate courses tend to be more trade focused. Um, and so we're very supportive of that concept at, at the AED. And we do think that, you know, uh, if people want to get over dealing with shortages, you know, we need people to become truck drivers, you know, uh, and well, that the best way to do that is to incentivize that training, allowing them to cover some of that cost just like somebody who's going for a four-year degree can get federal financial aid. So no, nothing concrete to report on it yet, but there's a lot of discussion going on. That's, that's awesome to hear that the discussion is actually happening at that level. Um, and, and I do agree a lot with what you said just about uh, the onus so frequently is put on um, kind of the federal government and, and the education system itself. But I do think that contractors also need to recognize that there is an element that, you know, when it comes to these career fairs that all of these colleges are showing up to, where are the dirt contractors? They, they don't place any value on, you know, it, yes, it's going to cost you some money to have a guy sit there for a day. But the value is what you get out of that. The fact that in, in another three or four years, you start having these high school students enter into the workforce as your operators, your mechanics, you know, the, the people that we need on the ground. So I do think that's a really important point that you make there. Let me just jump in there because the, the other point I would make is, you know, you brought up the contractors and I'll throw the equipment uh, dealers into this um, because we've seen a big change in uh, equipment dealers approach to this. I, I think that uh, we, we've also at the AED Foundation relaunched our high school uh, affiliation program so that we expose kids to these careers as they're making career choices. Um, you know, the, one of the biggest influencers on your career, uh, research has shown this, is your parents. And that makes sense because if your father or your mother was a diesel construction equipment technician, you're gonna have a very good understanding of what that career path is. If they're, a, if they're working for a contractor, well then you're gonna know all about that stuff because it's what you've grown up with. Same thing as if you, uh, you know, if your parent's a doctor, you're probably gonna have a little better inside track of how you become a doctor. What do you gotta to do to do those things? And I think that uh, I, it's good because a lot of our uh, AED members have started to uh, really uh, bump up their interaction with with high schools, uh, not only just career days, but creating opportunities for high school kids to take a look at the career opportunities. And, and I'll give a shout out. There is a great program going on in Montana called Build Montana that is actually a coalition program done with both equipment dealers and contractors to show uh, high schoolers uh, all the opportunities involved in, let's just say, the construction side of, of business, which includes, you know, obviously equipment distribution and service, as well as, well, if you want to build the roads, well, you know, we'll show you how that gets done in the careers entailed. With that. And so it's a great program. Uh, again, Build Montana. Uh, 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 one of our members, RDO Equipment, uh, very heavily involved with it. Uh, but the Montana Equipment uh, Association, as well as uh, the local AGC chapter, got together and, and, and put this thing together. And it's, uh, it's really been, uh, they just finished their first year, had the first group of kids go through uh, 
Last year, they're starting the second year of the program. A lot of potential. And we're starting to see industry recognize that if we're going to fix this, we're not going to fix this by sitting back. And that's why I started off talking about the, uh, the local school boards. Because the best way to create change is get somebody on the local school board who understands the value. And pushes that, the agenda. Yes, that's right. And pushes the agenda and says, wait a second. I'm a contractor. Wait a second. I work on diesel construction equipment. I'm telling you, these are good careers. And we should be training folks that want to go into those fields how to get there. Uh, no different than we should, you know, certainly be training folks who want to go on to the university. But, uh, you know, applied math is math. Uh, and somebody who's, who's being taught how to use math in a daily life uh, because of their job. I mean, when, when it comes to, you know, think of a construction contractor who's who's uh, sawing, you know, two by fours and, and getting the angles, figuring out how to do those things. Or if we're talking about road builders, um, I mean, there's a lot of skills that, quite frankly, get used uh, in, the, in the trades that people spend years studying at universities and never use. Sure, so. absolutely. And, and I do, to kind of go back to the point you had made earlier about uh, referring to the trades as educating and not training, as you were kind of talking through that as an operator, I sit here and I think, you know, yes, a doctor is working on a human body. And we can all agree that that's vastly more complex than anything we're doing in the dirt world. But at the same time, when you look at kind of the overall broad view of the education, both sets of individuals are going and getting educated on the tools of their craft. They're getting educated on all of the variables and the situations they're going to be put in and all of the what ifs and contingencies. And then they have to apply those skills that they've learned over time. And and a lot of people, this is where, you know, I feel operators and, and a lot of the trades are very often not appreciated is there is a lot of skill just in a doctor's hands of, of suturing a wound and having to have that very, you know, sensitive touch. It's the exact same thing in these, these big machines. If I'm going to nudge a pipe into place with an excavator, this isn't something you can be a brute with. You have to have a very delicate touch. And those are skills that come with the same sort of time that these doctors are having to spend honing their craft. So, so Brian, you know, so both of the, anyone who's gotten into the cab, of, of a piece of equipment, whether it's ag or construction, forestry, mining. I mean, look at the look at the controls that the operator is responsible for operating. Look at the computerization that's running that machine. These are, you know, I, I, again, this is why I'm very – not anybody can jump into these machines and make them do what they need to do. And, and I think that that's where – there has to be a recognition, a re-recognition, because we used to have this recognition in our country, it wasn't that long ago, that both the doctor, the engineer, the operator of a piece of equipment, and the person fixing that piece of equipment, and let's include the people building the equipment, are just, you know, if they're practicing their trade uh, to the level they should be, both of them... Uh, are both skilled craftsmen, both the doctor and the operator uh, or, or the technician. And I think that that's, that's really where we have to get back to. That certainly, you know, uh, listen, it's no, uh, some people are going to make more money than others, right? But it doesn't mean that that job's not important. If that individual can live comfortably, raise a family, or do whatever's important to them, Right. That's what's important. And do something you love. You know, we start out, you know, the construction equipment industry is very interesting to me because we start out owning just about every kid in the United States. Who doesn't, male or female, who doesn't, you know, uh, play with uh, construction equipment? Tonkas. You're Tonkas. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. You know, I had so many Tonka trucks uh, when I was a kid. Uh, so, and my friends, I mean, we had a whole interstate system going through the backyard and got in trouble from my dad for digging up the lawn with the Tonka trucks. But let me tell you, it rivaled, it rivaled the interstate. Um, 
But then we kind of lose them, right? We lose them as they go through uh, school that somehow that you can't make a living at that or that's not that's not a good way to make a living. Well, diesel construction technicians, again, the guys that work on uh, construction equipment and the folks that work on fixing combines and things like that, you know, these folks make a great living. Uh, and in many places, they're making over six figures. Um, you know, so that's, I don't care where you live. You're making six figures or close to six figures. You're, you're going to be doing okay. You know, it's it's funny as you were talking about that one situation comes to mind um, where you talk about losing them because you're you're absolutely right. We do have these kids at a very early age and then something changes. And I think it's uh, I think this a, a lot of times comes down to a very subtle conversation happening with the parents. And one that comes to mind is uh, for a while in my career, I ran a concrete breaker and you literally walk beside this machine. It's got a huge five or 10 ton weight that just drops and pounds the concrete and breaks it up for the next operation. And there was one day in particular, we've got a heavy downpour. I'm standing out in my rain gear with my head down, trying to keep it out of my face. And I, what came to mind is all of these cars passing by. I'm the guy that you look at and go, and that's why you go to college. And I thought, but the problem with that is what they don't know sitting in their car is I'm making 85 grand a year working six months out of the year doing this. So who's coming out of this ahead? <laughs> that's absolutely. And I, and I think that the, and the other thing is, is that for somebody who likes to do that job, there's nothing wrong with the job. Listen, uh, so you get, to, you know, the positive is, yeah, you get to work outside. The negative is sometimes it rains, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so I think that we, we need to return to that appreciation for just work in general. But I think, you know, one of the best things that happened was the Great Recession from the standpoint of is it really caused people to reevaluate the cost of a degree versus lifelong earning potential. And, you know, listen, there's a lot of college degrees that don't cover the cost to get them. And, and, and again, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's certainly many. Uh, and I think the, I think the uh, recession reminded us, us of all that when, you know, a lot of people who had gone to, uh, had gotten liberal arts educations, again, nothing wrong with liberal arts education, but then could not find a job that required a liberal arts degree and were working in um, high-end coffee shops, getting guys like you their coffee as they drove through in their F-150s on the way to the job site. So, I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think it, it's really caused the conversation to, to, to swing a little bit. And parents are rediscovering the trades in general as a good alternative uh, to uh, going right for a four-year degree. And, and again, as I always say, education never stops. And so just because somebody goes to become a, a, an operator or a, or, a, or a technician doesn't mean that at some point they might not say, hey, I've been building the roads. I want to learn how to design them. You know, but again, whether or not they do that, as long as they're gainfully employed and can pay their bills and, and have the things that, 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 that are uh, translate to success for them, that's what's important. And I think that uh, the, the other aspect of this is, listen, our economy needs both. We can't function. You know, if no one's building our roads or no one's uh, – fixing the, the equipment that builds those roads, and no one's fixing the equipment that farmers use to raise our food, um, we're going to have a big issue real quick. And, and we're experiencing it just, you know, very, for the U.S., minor inconveniences. You know, you go to the, you go to the store and uh, maybe you can't buy Coca-Cola because the truck didn't arrive with it because we have a, uh, you know, we're dealing with a trucking shortage. But, but I think it's highlighting that all of these careers are important. And I also think this, that there's also a, uh, a point here that Congress needs to fix our immigration system as well. 
Because this is a country that has always, always uh, needed uh, fresh uh, people to immigrate here to help us fill the workforce that we need. Um, and so Congress has a lot of lifting to do. But as I said when we started, this is, a, this is an issue that people can solve locally. Um, by holding their school boards uh, accountable and making sure that schools, uh, school guidance uh, counselors are talking about careers in the trades just like they are about careers that require a university education. Um, and th and that, that's something we can do locally. And also it's really educating people that, you know, what, what you thought this industry was 40 years ago, well, we've progressed too. <laughs> you know, our equipment is much different too, you know. We've benefited from uh, safety uh, improvements in, the, in these industries as well. And so, uh, but again, I, I think the, you know, there's definitely a career uh, opportunity for folks in the skilled, uh, skilled trades, and, and we need them. We, we need people who will build construction equipment, you know, go to work for, uh, for the, the companies that make it. We need folks who will come work for AED dealers uh, when it comes to fixing the equipment. And we need people to work for our customers who use the equipment. Uh, and all the people it takes to uh, do a, uh, an infrastructure project from, you know, the, the laborers, the operators, uh, the carpenters, uh, all of those. We, we need all of those skilled uh, work positions filled. So along those lines of talking about infrastructure and, and kind of jumping back over to the, the Congress topic, um, as everyone knows, the infrastructure bill just went through. And, and not only is that going to create kind of relatively immediate jobs, there will be a little bit of a lag, but relatively immediate. But there's also a long term. I want to say it's over the course of 10 years that we're going to have these projects funded. That's going to require a pretty large workforce. Could you kind of talk about some of the aspects that were built into the infrastructure bill that address the workforce issue on that? Yeah, you know, uh, the uh, well, most of that has been left for this uh, for the uh, what they're calling the Build Back Better uh, program, uh, where most of the job uh, funds are are housed. Um, but there, but there's no doubt, Brian, that the infrastructure bill is going to create a huge opportunity for folks in the trades um, from an employment standpoint. And, and the infrastructure bill uh, is a, is a five year bill um, that may get extended, you know, is, is it, cause it'll take them a year and a half to roll out, roll out projects. All of the funding. And yeah. And figure out how they're doing it and all that. Um, but listen, park the infrastructure bill, which which I would never normally say, park that in, in a parking lot for one second, because this the infrastructure bill also reauthorized the Highway Trust Fund for five more years, the Surface Transportation uh, Fund, which is key to most projects that are done on the interstate. Most of those are match projects done with a match of federal highway funds, uh, Though people don't like to talk about the gas tax, that's how we pay for this. Uh, the gas tax pays for all of our roads. Um, and so the feds will match state uh, DOT projects. Uh, and so that you got five years there, plus you have the additional funding for highways, bridges, railroads, airports, you know, the charging stations for electric cars, um, the uh, there's a, a component in there for, uh, I believe, school and hospital construction, rural broadband. Uh, and so that's on top of this reauthorization of, of the highway funds. And so uh, certainly wonderful opportunity. Um, now, did they put enough money in the uh, infrastructure bill to cover training, education, recruitment? No. Uh, no, they, they did not. Um, but the uh, that's okay because we can w listen. As long as there's work, we can we can handle that. Yeah, supply and demand. Right. Ultimately, the market will make it work. The market. Will <laughs> make, I'm confident the market will make it work. And sure. Uh, but again, 
it, and I think it will continue this push that I talked about earlier of recognition that the, these are good careers. These are good careers, and um, they're not dead end careers. Remember, the, the thought used to be if you became a uh, if if you were a contractor or an operator, right? You were stuck. That's what you did for twenty the rest years, of your life. You know, yeah. Um, and your day was regulated really by two 15-minute coffee breaks and, and lunch. Well, that's just not true anymore. The opportunity for somebody who has that education, you can go into sales, you know, for the industry. You can go into management. Um, you know, you don't necessarily um, – you're not locked into that position. And so I, I, I think there's – uh, and I think people are grasp, re-grasping that because, listen, most contracting companies weren't started by the person who went to, you know, came out of college, right? And they usually start by the guy who says, you know what, I can do a better job of this. I can make more money if I own my own company. And, uh, and that's how most contractors start. You know, uh, certainly the first generation of the business. Some of the most respectable contractors I have spoken to uh, uh, and on my personal channel, Diesel and Iron, I make a point to really I ask the question every time. Do you have a college degree? And I would say nine out of ten of them don't have any college education yet. You can sit there and have a conversation with them and they will speak to you on the level of a business consultant about their business, the industry, the economy relating to their business. So, well, Brian, that's because as we started our conversation, they're not uneducated. Correct. They just don't have a college degree and then and, and that's they don't have the piece of paper, you know, uh, but they're educated um, and they're running businesses. And I and as I always say. And they usually got a few guys who went to college working for them, answering to them. Uh, you know, so I, I don't necessarily, you know, again, it's that education and lifelong learning. And that's really what we need to talk about and, and focus on is that that's what we want kids to understand when they come out of high school, that it, learning never ends. And if it does, once you stop learning, then you stop advancing. Absolutely. And whether that, and that applies to everything. Yes. You know, whether that's whether that learning takes place on the job site at a at a at an apprentice uh course, uh, you know, after you've worked all day and they send you to send you to school at night to, to take the next step or 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 whatever program somebody might be involved in, it's that lifelong learning. And and that and getting that education. No different than if you're that if you're a, a white collar professional, you constantly have to continue learning if you want to advance and if you want to be the best at what you do. And the uh, certainly these careers afford people that and afford them the opportunity if they want. You know, they can go wherever they wherever they want to go. They want to own the business. Uh, those are all opportunities you have. And again, because we're not talking about low paying jobs with no benefits uh, with and especially right now I don't know about you Brian um, but in in, in your uh, network of, of, of friends and, and acquaintances do you know any contractor that's paying below market wages that's paying that doesn't have some sort of benefits that to I mean the market has corrected those things. For those, I was going to say the only ones doing that are the ones that can't find anyone to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. So I, I think there's a great opportunity here, and and I think the conversations like this, programs like yours, getting the message out uh, to folks about the exciting opportunities uh, in the skilled uh, trades area is what we need to do. Um, you know, we need to be much more vocal about what takes place in, in these fields and how you get into them and the exciting opportunities that there are. And I think that uh, kids are finding them. You know, YouTube now, uh, you know, you can go find out about any car, any job, any career. Anything. You know, um, you know whether, whether you're cooking or, or trying to repair something at your house, you can find a video on it. And the same is true about careers. And so kids 
where, where we have to be better as an industry is getting the message out that, hey, come take a look at us. Come take a look at this. This is a great, in, you know, in, in my case from the uh, uh, equipment dealer side, hey, this is a great industry. And, you know, we have great customers. So. So just on the note of YouTube, I, I've always had the opinion that all of these preppers are nuts because you don't need a warehouse full of food and water. All you need is a hard drive with a backup copy of YouTube on it, and you can do whatever you need to do to rebuild society. <laughs> you, you, you're absolutely uh, – I, I think that the next uh, group of survivalists will probably have that uh, – have that in just the, a in quick the, YouTube guide. <laughs> have them in their bunker so that they can uh, read, you know, listen to uh, the video of, of how to do things. I, I think there's really right to that. So my final question is, is I'm just going to preface it by saying this is a, a total personal speculation that I'm asking. We won't hold you to any of this, but uh, just kind of with your position uh, and what you do, I value your opinion. Over the next, call it five to ten years, what are your personal predictions of how Washington will respond to the labor force issue? And then on top of that, how does AED kind of assist in that? And, and what do you guys do and how do you play into that? I think, listen, I, I think that, uh, you know, Washington will will certainly be sending more monies to this. My prediction is you'll see more money going to things like the Perkins uh, Act, uh, which th for those of your viewers that don't know, the Perkins Act really funds most technical training at community colleges uh, and, and throughout the state. You know, uh, high schools, you know, receive funding under under those for their technical programs and things like that. So Perkins is a big is a big issue. I think you'll see heightened awareness of the impact of the Perkins funding, um, which will lead to increased funding because as we're as we launch over the next five years to address our infrastructure issues. I really believe this is part one because even after we do all these projects, we've got another five years of work to do. Um, so we're going to need people in the industry. So I think Washington recognizes that. Take them a little while to figure out how they do it. Um, but uh, they recognize that we have this, this shortage. And so where the AED Foundation comes in, and AED is – so our foundation did a, did a study not too long ago. Uh, we had the College of William and Mary do it. And so we know that in our industry, the, the equipment industry, we need 70,000, 70,000 equipment technicians to work on equipment. Uh, okay, 70,000. Now, we're not recruiting near enough of those. So what are we doing to, to try to stem that tide? Well, we accredit uh, programs across the country at uh, technical schools that teach diesel construction technicians. So we'll come in. I always tell people, think about the uh, American Medical Association that accredits medical schools. We'll go with that because you used that uh, analogy earlier. So we come in and we say, hey, Where's your program? And if you want to be recognized by AED, you have to teach to these standards. And we send out field evaluators, and then we go back uh, after four years to check on it uh, and re-examine to make sure they're continuing the program. We also set up advisory boards for those schools uh, so that they can stay in touch with the, re the people on the ground to make sure they're teaching to what the local area needs in that, in that sphere. We also, as I said, have our high school program to create a pipeline of people to get into those programs at the college level. Then we also do, as I mentioned, the research uh, to help us go up to the hill with armed with facts, not opinions, not stories, but facts on the economic impact of not having these people in the jobs. What's that doing to our country? What's it doing to our industry? Um, and we just launched a campaign uh, at uh, AED. We'll be announcing it in uh, when we're in Orlando at our annual meeting uh, in uh, January. Uh, our foundation has just launched, uh, we'll be announcing a $5 million campaign. It's called Vision 2025. And part of it, that 
that goal is to use that money. You know, a lot of people hear fundraising things and they think you're building your endowment or you're doing so. Well, no, we're raising the money to spend it. Uh, so we're going to uh, – our goal is to get to a, over 100 accredited schools. Currently, we're, we're in the high 60s. We, we want to go to 150 affiliated high schools. And we want to work uh, – we want to bring some folks on to work on workforce issues with our dealers, our members, on the ground on recruiting and, and the best ways to uh, – uh, attract people to the industry. We talked about Build Montana earlier. Great programs like that exist all over the country. We just need to find them and connect the dots with people to get kind of program. centralize yeah. everything. Sure. So, uh, you know, have people that can do that. Uh, and then uh, we want to make sure that the foundation can continue. So we'll take a little piece of that and stick it into our endowment. But most of the money is being raised to actually be spent on uh, – training technicians and promoting the uh, opportunities here. And in general, you're seeing that occur across the skilled trades uh, spectrum. You know, I, I talk about our little piece of the, of the equipment uh, technicians, but, you know, the NAM is doing something very similar. A, uh, which is the National Association of Manufacturers, has a big uh, – Manufacturing uh, Worker Campaign, uh, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, AEM, uh, who are the folks that build all the equipment that uh, equipment dealers sell. You know, they have a large campaign uh, because of their workforce needs, educating uh, folks on the opportunities and the high skill level, you know, that's involved here. We talked earlier about the operator. I mean, this is like high-tech video games, right? Uh, when, you, when, you're, when you're in there. So, hey, if you enjoy that, we might be a career opportunity for you. So, but, so that's kind of what we're, we're focused on on these right now, as well as, remember I spoke earlier about getting federal aid uh, to be able to be used for these certificate-type programs that allow people to learn a skill for, this, for the trades and then get into the workforce quickly. Uh, but but allowing uh, some of those education dollars, just as if I was going for a degree in communications or psychology, to apply at the, at the community college level. So we'll continue to lobby for that. And we will continue to raise the flag uh, with the AED um, in Washington with our, our lawmakers about how important this is and how we can't we can't walk away from this. It's too important. We need to keep up the uh, the pressure, um, and we need to make sure that we continue to educate our local school officials on the importance of these careers. And, and we will continue to champion that um, because it's it's just so important. Absolutely. I and and I can say as a ground level person. It is it is exciting to hear that there are these sort of conversations happening at those upper levels of government and, and at the upper levels of, of, you know, like the AED, these big organizations that have much more influence and sway than any individual contractor does. So that is very exciting news. Well, we will continue to uh, we will continue to do that. And uh, but don't Brian, don't ever underestimate. And I hope your viewers don't either the ability for one person to create change on this issue. It only takes one person to go to the school board to say, hey, where's it's the just about to say program? you're going to go get me signing up for the school board now. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> well, thank you for the time, Brian. I really do. I, I genuinely appreciated this conversation. This was a great time. Well, good. Let's do this. Let's uh, let's promise to check in uh, as as the year progresses and uh, We'll come back and hopefully have good news about uh, some of the workforce issues as we continue. Well, thank you again to Brian for being on the show and discussing such an important topic. And, and what I said there in the interview was 100 percent genuine. It is very exciting to know that this problem is being recognized at the top levels, that there are some very important, very uh, exciting conversations happening. So hopefully 
this problem will, you know, regardless, as I said in the interview, the labor market is going to work this problem out. But hopefully we can start getting an influx of people into the trades before the market has to decide that wages need to increase to the point that building becomes astronomically expensive. So as with everything else, though, time will tell. We appreciate you watching and we'll catch you guys on the next episode of The Dirt.